full screen. I can't hear you now. I wasn't talking. Oh yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was looking at the YouTube stream and I think there's a delay. Okay, good. Okay, so this is the last lecture of the last day of the school, and we have a special speaker who is uh, Shami Mitra, an editor from Physical uh, Review Letters, and he's going to explain us how to publish, get papers accepted in Physical Review Letters, and uh, how to present our results, publications, and dissemination. And he, he, he said that he would like to have a lot of questions. So, Sean, whenever you want. Okay. Um, thank you, Maya. And thank you, Adolfo, and to all the other organizers for um, inviting me to do this presentation. Now, of course, uh, in a typical in person presentation, I would basically have made this a uh, complete uh, QA session. And in that sense, of course, this is not a physics talk and it's uh, very far removed from any topological phases of anything. And so I, uh, uh, like Maya said, I'd be very happy to get interrupted uh, with any questions. And we uh, go through to the end of uh, the session and it doesn't really matter if I don't get through uh, many or even most of the slides because after all, uh, there may be things that folks here are interested in hearing about, which uh, I have not uh, explicitly uh, scheduled uh, myself to speak on. Um, I will uh, try to swap between two uh, presentations, if I may. Uh, I hope that'll work out well with uh, Slack sharing, we'll see. Um, so um, basically what I wanted to uh, kind of, uh, and again, just stop me at any time, either uh, through a chat to Maya, because I don't see the chat here at my end because I'm in full screen mode, or uh, just uh, raise your hand. And I guess Maya, you'll interrupt uh, me and ask the question. Yes, I will. Okay, thanks. Um, so I wanted to, uh, give you a sense of, um, uh, you know, when we conveying, talking about conveying physics results, uh, what we have uh, typically is, uh, I mean, the, 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 the pieces of the puzzle, if you will, are limited. We don't, I mean, what we have are posters, talks, and journal articles, essentially. And then of course, uh, what depends is, uh, and uh, as the audience gets larger, as you try to disseminate your physics results, the uh, expertise in that, at uh, the average audience member is far removed from what yours is. So typically at the very beginning of, uh, of, of one's career or uh, at an early stage, what you are typically presenting are contributed short talks, perhaps 10 minutes talks and so on, and posters. So there, of course, the number of people in your audience is small, but the expertise amongst those audience members is large. So these people are uh, more or less working in your field, and that's why they're there. So you, you're kind of talking as if to colleagues in your own field. And then of course, uh, then uh, you have papers uh, that come out of it, which are papers for specialized journals. So for example, if it's something on 
uh, flow cases, you know, uh, physics and condensed matter systems, you might publish them in a journal such as PRB, where again, your readership is mostly people in your field. And then uh, you go on to invited longer talks uh, where uh, it could be a colloquium level presentation where uh, audience members may be in completely different fields of physics or even different fields of science. And then uh, you get papers for journals that are of broad interest, either in physics, such as PRL, nature physics, and so on, or at some level, even beyond physics, such as nature, science, et cetera. And then of course, eventually, uh, I think one of the challenges of all scientists, particularly, I mean, including physicists, is that you want to, at the end of the day, convey your results to the broader public, most of whom are responsible for funding your research at a basic level. PRL in particular, I would say, has, a, has a, a, what I term as a balancing act. And I'll explain what I mean, that we are trying to cover uh, four kind of uh, constraints, if you will, which sometimes even to me seem to be mutually exclusive. So what I mean by that is we have a certain size. So PRL publishes about 2,500, 2,000 to 2,500 papers in a given year, while that is substantially fewer than what we published about uh, I would say five, six years ago, when we used to publish about 4,000 a year, this size is still an order of magnitude larger than other phys broad interest physics journals, such as Nature Physics, or even our own uh, Physical Review X. However, the size allows us to do two things. One is it provides breadth in the sense that we publish in all areas of physics. So PRL publishes a substantial number of papers in fields ranging from high energy particle physics to plasma physics, to soft matter physics, to of course, condensed matter physics. But at the same time, what this size allows us to do that any, in any given field of physics, we are able to publish enough papers that if you're in that field, you get a sense that most of the important steps uh, or developments in the field for a given year are being represented in the pages of the journal. So for example, if we publish uh, plasma physics, our intention is not to publish one or two plasma physics papers a year, but to publish a substantial critical uh, mass of plasma physics papers, if you will, that provide um, a sense of what's happening in the world of plasma physics in that given year. Uh, but at the same time, we are exclusive in the sense that in any given field, we are publishing very few papers. Our, um, so our acceptance rate and such are not particularly high. And so there, there's that. So it's kind of a balancing act. And uh, we do have, and I think one of my next slides would tell me that this balance between exclusivity and breadth and representation provides challenge challenges for us, particularly in... Uh, in very topical fields. So just to give you a sense. Ah, this is a slide I just, uh, as a kind of, uh, I mean, PRL of course, as uh, most of you know, has done very well in uh, frontier top flight physics over the years. So much so that in the last 10 years, 10 consecutive years of PRLs have been cited uh, for, um, the Nobel Prize, uh, Physics Nobel Prize. So this is a sense of uh, what PRL publishes today. Uh, to, this goes up to 2016, but the numbers in 2016 are essentially similar to the numbers in 2006. So you see here, uh, you cannot see my mouse, is that correct? Oh, I think well, we can. you cannot see. We can. Uh, uh, you can? Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, so you see that here, uh, this uh, condensed matter structure and condensed matter transport to me and to most condensed matter people is an artificial uh, uh, separation. So really, if you look at the, uh, the numbers, uh, the bars in red are lower on average than the bars in blue, because as I noted before, we are publishing fewer papers uh, today, the same as 2016, than we used to do a decade earlier. 
On the other hand, you can see that the bulk of the journal really in terms of absolute numbers is condensed matter, structure and transport and soft matter, which I mean, there's more of an overlap. There are some areas in the journal where are, uh, which have a whole different field. So for example, particles and fields include papers, uh, experimental papers, for example, from big collaborations like the LHC or, or um, Fermilab or Slack and such. And those are oft sometimes papers with thousands of authors, but of course there's just the one paper. So that's a substantially different. In, uh, um, now, uh, just to give you a sense of how the challenges of subfields develop over time, so I just looked this up yesterday. So in the year 2020, that's uh, calendar year of 2020, we received 154 papers where just a search on uh, the word, some I mean, of these are very topical uh, areas. So on the Boolean and between non-Hermitian and topological in the title or abstract, 154 papers were submitted to the FISREV journals, all of them. The number for that in 2010 was only three. So you can see how quickly fields can uh, develop and you have a, so, in, so out of these 154, 70 were submitted to PRL and then eventually PRL published 20 papers out of that subset, uh, which had uh, those two keywords in their title or abstract. That 20 was zero for PRL in 2010. Um, so that gives you a sense of uh, what uh, fields are. I mean, there are uh, particular fields that uh, suddenly get extremely topical. We can think of other fields such as you know, magnesium diboride or uh, nictite superconductors and such, where the topicality rapidly changes from uh, even year to year. And then the other challenge for a journal such as PRL, and this of course applies to other journals, including you know, several of the nature journals are, I mean, these broad interest journals is some fields which we clearly consider to be physics uh, at some point in time, then at some later point in time may not be physics anymore. So to give you an example, graphene in the early uh, years of this century was clearly in the territory of physics. I mean, the, most of the papers appeared in physics the Nobel Prize was given out in physics. And I think uh, the people who were working at that time were mostly physicists on graphene. Now you fast forward a decade, and this was um, you know, a, a statement by the conference organizers in 2017 at this uh, meeting in Athens. And you can see the keywords that are, uh, according to them, appealing to participants, right? And so the keywords are words such as optoelectronics, biotechnology, materials, renewable energy. And so it is unclear at this time whether uh, the study of graphene is a physics enterprise, so to speak. And I think if you go to a typical meeting, such as graphene or graphene week, uh, you know, in 2022, and you look around and you, you know, talk to people, I would be surprised if more than 20% of them come from a physics background. This is clearly different uh, from what the case was a decade ago, but also importantly, it differs from field to field. So for example, if you go to a meeting in um, nuclear physics, for example, um, most of the attendees at such a meeting will be from the world, the larger world of physics, and that situation would have been roughly uh, the same 20 years ago. So there are some fields which are moving in and out of the world of physics and hence out of uh, PRL's um, uh, orbit, so to speak. And some fields are squarely in PRL's orbit over time. And so uh, this is also reflected in where papers appear, where papers are submitted, where people perhaps should submit their papers and so on. But this is a constant challenge that we have to uh, tackle in our journal. Um, I'm gonna stop here in case, I'm just gonna give you a few uh, stats about the journal. Does anyone have any questions about anything or any, uh, shall I veer off into something else or keep going? Uh, Anton has a question. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll let Anton go and then I, I can ask my question. 
All right, yeah, if that's okay, I'm going to use my panelist and I'm just going to uh, to say the question. So yeah. uh, this is actually quite interesting. Um, you mentioned you mentioned several uh, constraints that the, that PRL applies, and uh, and uh, I wonder about two things. First of all, uh, you aim for broad readership, uh, but actually, how do you know that you reach the aim? So, how do you have evidence that people from different communities are reading papers that that are not about their own work? Um, that is one aspect of the question. Another aspect is, um, I, I think that at least historically, or at least some of the PRL's constraints uh, are there for historical reasons, like uh, four pages don't even exist these days since it's, there are no pages anymore. Uh, so do you think uh, that... Yeah, I'll answer your uh, second question first and go to the other one, because the first one is an easy answer is we don't really know. But the, the second question... I think you're right in that uh, the, uh, as you said, the four page constraint is self-imposed and historical. That's true. On the other hand, you know, in the world of physics in particular, we think things are different compared to some years ago, but it's not so much different. So for example, uh, pretty much in all journals, we still have a concept of uh, an article. So if you go to any journal at the at the base level, of course, we still have an electronic entity, which is pretty much all the time a PDF article. I mean, they do have a you know, web HTML uh, rendering of it, but at, you know, there is, I don't think there is any journal in physics which does not have a PRL, um, uh, sorry, a PDF uh, uh, baseline, if you will. And what that means is at, that, at some point in all journals, not just PRL, you have like a timestamp, if you will. Like, okay, here is what the published entity is, and this is different from what was on the archive three weeks ago. And if the archive entity changes, somebody puts a date on it. So that limitation is, I think, more so in physics than something else. Just to go to the very general non-science world, right? Uh, if you, just this morning, let's say I'm looking at the New York Times, I'll give you an example. And we happen to live in New York, so we get the paper copy. And the paper copy is the piece that is frozen in time as to what it was at 2 a.m. or 1 a.m. in New York City area. Now, of course, if you go to the website, right off the get-go at 6 a.m., it's very different from what the paper copy was. Not only that, if you go at 6 and at 6.30, there, is, there are different entities. Things are moving. And there is really no concept, I think, anymore of what is an archival Thing. So if on like, what is the New York Times front page on the 27th of August, which is an easy question to have answered 20 years ago, you cannot answer it now. But in our journal, so at the, at the base level, I think if it turns out that the world of physics decides that this PDF, which is really just an electronic rendition of what is thought of as a hard copy, does not matter. Everything should be a fluid, fungible, electronic page, if you will then I think we would have to change. I think our current position is that this four page limitation, which does you know, affect us negatively at times because there are times when uh, we would prefer to have long, you know, the authors who submit uh, to us would like, would, you know, eight pages would be much better than four, let's say. If the argument is 30 pages would be better, then our decision is somewhat clearer. We'll say, you know, just submit to a journal with, without the limitations. But sometimes, indeed, eight would be better than four. I mean, it's not four anymore. It's become a little expanded because we count. But um, anyway, that's what it is. And then, of course, we have moved into the world of, of supplemental material, which has pros and cons. I can go into it if you want. But, you know, so, that cons, so that's added on to the end of it. And we also have two other things, and then I'll move on. A, for certain papers where the editors have determined that it is worth the journals while, and also for readers to have a longer paper, we do allow additional length. So every once in a while, you'll see PRLs which have six, seven, even more pages. I mean, we uh, famously, the, uh, the BICEP2 paper had 20 pages, but that's a whole different. Uh, I think the LHC paper, uh, the gravitational waves paper had well uh, more. Um, and then also we strongly encourage and we facilitated that fairly well, I think, 
joint submissions to PRL and let's say FISREP B at the same time, and they are supposedly can move along fairly smoothly through the process. And that way, I mean, the downside of a supplemental material is that it's not a citable entity and it's just sitting there and you know of its existence only if you land on the uh, journal article, but otherwise you wouldn't. Uh, whereas if you have a separate journal, uh, Anyway, so that's uh, some of the issues, but uh, I'll uh, continue. And uh, did somebody else have a question or I don't remember, Adolfo? Yeah, I think I have a question on the burden per editor. Is that mm -hmm. similar to other journals uh, different or are you like, uh, overwhelmed? You mean uh, the, the, number the number of papers of editor, handled yeah. by an editor in a given year? Yeah. Like, is that uh, comparable to other journals like Nature Physics or? or uh, uh, I think that's, uh, well, I mean, there are two. One is the absolute number of papers that come in. Mm -hmm. I think they're roughly comparable. It's not an order of magnitude difference. But I think the difference a little bit between uh, uh, PRL and perhaps some other journals is, and we can, I mean, discuss this if you wish, but I think PRL currently, I. I, I suspect rejects 30 to 40% of incoming papers without review. And a typical editor in the journal is handling, let's say 600 to 800 papers a year. So a third of those papers are, uh, um, uh, let's say are rejected without review, which means that two thirds of them are sent out to, to referees and not all of them uh, entail the uh, same amount of work and so on. So roughly I think, uh, that if you just look at the absolute number, I don't think there's a you know order of magnitude type difference, but how much work goes into a paper or how many papers are reviewed and things like that may differ from journal to journal. Um, I see a question and answer. Should I click on it or is somebody going to ask me? Let me see. Uh, you can click on it and read it or I can read it. As okay, well. I'll read it. I'll read it. So the All question right. is, how does this going in and out of the in quotes physics zone happen? Uh, is it, for example, purely the number of papers that get submitted from an area to PRL? Do you monitor this change of trend actively? Uh, I think if you mean by monitor it actively, whether we are doing it live at the time, and uh, not really. On the other hand, do we have a sense of these changes uh, with the benefit of hindsight? Yes, I mean, this is uh, not just in terms of the journal, but you can, you know, anyone can go to, for example, uh, a Web of Science or NASA ADS or the archive and get a very clear sense as to spikes in particular fields in physics. I mean, the archive is a good place to see because, I mean, the only people submitting, uh, let's say, a graphene or 2D materials paper to the condensed matter combat archive are mostly physicists. And so you get a sense of, you know, what's what do they come from a physics background or a materials uh, or chemistry background uh, or, or, or the, and that uh, these kind of changes, uh, I think, are uh, happen in most many other fields, but in physics in particular. And now, of course, the definition, I mean, there are fields uh, like material science or energy research and the question of what's physics and what's chemistry is, is uh, in some of these areas, uh, somewhat fluid, I think. Uh, and as I noted before, in some other areas, such as high energy physics or particle physics or such, uh, that uh, is it physics or is it something else is, I think, more clear cut. Oops, there's another question. No, that's it. Okay, so I'll continue. And just uh, chat or uh, one of the things I, I think my, people may not recognize is that the journals of physical review and not just PRL are very global. Two thirds of our, uh, even this two thirds is old news, I would say 70 to 75% of our papers come from outside the US and referees are from outside the US and even the revenue from the journals and all. So it's a, it's a very global entity. Uh, here are some numbers, and you will see from here that basically half of the published journal is from Europe now. And uh, these numbers are from 2017. I am a little embarrassed and that I should have updated it for 2021, but uh, I think uh, uh, numbers will not be that different. Um, 
So this gives you a sense of where, and again, some uh, geographical areas are showing sharper growth in absolute numbers, but more in proportional numbers, you know, fraction of published papers uh, than other areas. Uh, the referees, of course, are also uh, equally uh, come from uh, a very international background. And this, uh, this has changed over time. Uh, I think um, 15 years ago, it was much more US centric, if you will, the referees, more so than the papers. But then uh, several uh, recent developments, and these are good things that the internet gives us as opposed to many other things which are not so good. One of them is that entities and pages such as Google Scholar and all have made it much easier than before to get a good global sense of who is publishing what in what fields, who are the active people and so on. And so this kind of uh, literature search and searching for referees and so on has become much more democratized, if you will. That's the first thing. And I'll, I'll, the other thing that has happened and that's, that happened a few years even before that, is that everything is electronic, of course, now. And so there is this concept, uh, there's no uh, physical male-related and such delays and considerations between whether a referral, uh, for example, is being sent from New York to Australia or from New York to um, uh, Chicago. There's no difference. I mean, these, these kind of things used to matter once upon a time, which were uh, self-limiting constraints. Ah, so this was a question, uh, you know, as I said, uh, I received, I have a separate, uh, uh, if I, I was going to say it's a Q&A kind of thing, and uh, people ask all kinds of questions, which I have some slides on, but this was a big, a very broad, <laughs> um, a broad um, bird's eye question. So these are the biggest challenges on the horizon for scientific publishing. So these are, so I have a slide for what I think these challenges are going to be. Well, as you can imagine, there are some challenges and most of which we do not know the answers to. The first is, is the concept of peer review here to stay? I don't know. I mean, it's possible that uh, uh, in, there are other areas where, uh, you know, uh, reviews of entities have been democratized, such as, uh, you know, product reviews and so on. But at the same time, they have uh, journals where one or two individuals review things and they have stayed. So we don't know. All indications are that the, at, at this point, it is here to stay. And one of the examples I have, uh, I'll give is, uh, for example, there are areas on the archive, in particular, let's say HEPTH, that's high energy physics theory papers, where every paper that is submitted to our journal, for example, has been on the archive for sometimes weeks before they come in. So, and most practitioners in those fields access that material through the archive and not through the journals. So the question remains as to why are journals in high energy physics doing quite well, perhaps even better than they ever have. And that's because for whatever reason, uh, researchers still find it useful uh, to submit to journals. I mean, these re well, we can, one can argue as to those reasons should exist or not, but that's a different point. I think the reality is that at this time, the journals are not the sources of dissemination so much. No one needs the journals as such to access the information, but uh, they are still uh, there to provide uh, a stamp of validity and the value of peer review. Second question is, uh, this reliance on metrics such as impact factor, H index, and so on, and how this should play out and whether this is good or bad are decisions from uh, hiring to career movement and so relying too, many, too much on these are journals are becoming. Uh, so these are questions which will change over time. I think we don't know the answer. The answer I think today is that perhaps, yes, we are over relying on metrics, but how it will be you know, five years from now, 10 years from now. Social media, in some fields, social media has taken over considerably and everything from sales of books to uh, what kind of epidemiology the average person knows is driven largely by social media. 
uh, in the world of physics, it's less, I think, prominent than it, it, it has been in some other areas. Uh, but then, you know, uh, there are, I don't, I mean, I would, could talk more about it in person, but, uh, you know, there are, so social media plays a role, but not to the extent that it does in some other fields of research or even in other fields of science. And then free is free viable. That's a big challenge, right? I mean, so Google Scholar uh, and the archive uh, provides access to every, uh, I mean, theoretically could provide access to every article that's published in the journals. So at some point, if you have the access to the articles combined with some kind of vetting process that is independent of the journals, then of course, um, things are different. There's the whole challenge of open access versus subscription model that's ongoing. And the last one we already discussed in response to Anton's question that uh, what is a paper after all, if, if it became some kind of fluid entity, then the roles of the journals may uh, change. We don't know. Um, I'm gonna skip this, skip this. So the, one of the questions is why are there journals still around? I think one of the things uh, we can talk is that Germans do certain things that just a, a web posting on the archive a similar does not provide. So of course, dissemination, but one could argue that dissemination happens with the archive. But uh, if you want to go and somebody had this question before, slightly cross field, uh, if you have a paper uh, which is talking about some aspects of lead materials that may be of interest to somebody who is doing, I don't know, polymer physics, for example, if it's sitting in con mat alone, they may not see it. So there's that. There's of course the stamp of validity, which is important that this has been peer reviewed and has appeared in this or that journal. And some people value those particular kinds of stamps, if you will. Curation is always important. So, you know, there are a thousand articles that might appear on a, uh, a particular time frame on the archive, but uh, the non-specialist might say that, uh, I don't have time to look at a thousand, tell me which uh, 50 I should look at. So the journals perform that role. It is not a given that the journals alone should perform that role. I mean, it's entirely possible that you could have other individuals, for example, that people may trust. Highlighting is very important. So for example, when you have uh, a particular development in physics that then is covered by the news media and appears in the pages of a prominent newspaper, it's almost all, it's almost never the case that the journalist is looking it up on the archive and then deciding to highlight it. They are looking at uh, the journals and the, the journals are certainly, uh, the more prominent journals have a fairly established, well-established um, kind of uh, way to reach out to journalists. There are journalists subscribed to their uh, soon to be published lists and they have correspondence and the people hired for that purpose, so there's that. We already covered about the journals and their uh, impact on non-journal decisions, such as getting tenure, promotions, hiring, and so on. This may be fortunate or unfortunate, but that's reality. And then of course, outreach to a wide audience, that's very important. At the end of the day, as we all know, um, the, the challenge, ongoing challenge for scientists at large and physicists in particular, is that we do want the non-technical, non-scientist population to have some sense of the importance of what we do. Because at the end of the day, if the general public gets uh, disinterested and unaware of what uh, presumably good work that scientists are doing, then that's not good for scientists at, in particular and you know, population at large. All right, I'm gonna stop again in case somebody has any questions. I'm gonna just say a few words about our review process. Any questions, anyone? Through the chat or through Adolfo and Maya? All right. All right, so PRL's review process is probably fairly similar to that of other journals. The most important thing to, uh, to tell folks here is that most papers that come into PRL are usually very good papers. So 
most papers that are submitted to PRL are not ones that are clearly incorrect or um, clearly invalid. And so once, you know, we, so we have this, as I mentioned before, the subset of papers we do not send out to referees because our sense is that even if this paper is deemed to be correct, there's nothing wrong with them as far as the science is concerned, uh, it would be very unlikely that we would publish it. And so those papers we do not send to referees. However, of the papers that we are sending to referees, a large fraction of them, a majority of them for sure, are not ones that the referees eventually tell us that their science is incorrect. And then of course, once we have determined that the science is correct, then the decision to publish it or not publish it at some level becomes subjective. And uh, so uh, that's the first thing to remember that from the author's perspective, they submitted significant, important, correct work to PRL, but the journal in many instances is not publishing that work. And the question is why? And that's largely because the journal has some uh, an, a sense of the threshold and their estimation with the uh, knowledge of the paper, what they know of the field, what the referees have told them, the editor's uh, knowledge, for example, has not persuaded them that this paper is above that threshold. So that's the, and uh, the other question is uh, also we ask ourselves, and this is again, uh, something which uh, is uh, not a precise objective thing is that we are looking for a reason to publish a paper in PRL is why this paper should be published in PRL because it could have been published in some other journal. And we're looking for a reason to, that tells us that it should be in PRL for a, and then, so that reason again is, uh, it's at the end of the day, slightly subjective. And now here's some uh, for the, uh, uh, for the uh, folks who are in this session, who are, um, perhaps early-ish in their career. So uh, kind of uh, making a case for publishing your paper in PRL. So here the scenario is that you're trying to persuade the editors and the referees as to why your paper should be in PRL. Presumably you have convinced yourself that it should be in PRL because that is why you have submitted to the journal. So the first step, and this is of course uh, one of the, <laughs> I always try to show this is that because when a paper is submitted to any journal, it's certainly a journal that is read by uh, people who are not necessarily experts in your field, keep things simple, omit needless words, do not use terminology that would be only meaningful to extreme experts in the field. Because remember at the end of the day, PRL is a physics journal, but not a journal in the subfield of physics that you're working in. The best way I think to do that is to, once you've got the paper in a form that you think you should be um, sending to the journal, ask a colleague who is a physicist, but not someone in your field to read the paper and give you feedback. If this colleague is unable to understand at least the introduction and the confusion, then tell yourself that you have a problem in that uh, referees and editors will have similar difficulty in understanding the paper. Um, all parts of an article are equal, but some are more equal than others. And so the interesting thing is that there are some parts of any, any physics uh, article that you know, stick out first and foremost in the minds of readers than others. So we got the abstract, Sometimes it's just the title. And just to, uh, you know, uh, in, so the title in the year 2021 is, has a greater significance than let's say even a decade ago. And that's because of uh, social media, for example, you know, Twitter, when people are tweeting about your paper and it uh, hopefully pre-publication, but certainly post-publication, getting some traction in terms of publicity often only the title is floating out. When you post your article on the archive, people look at the title when they you know, land on the page. To look at the PDF, they have to take an additional step and click on a link. They may not click on the link if the title or 
you know, if they're familiar with the names of the authors, perhaps they'll click on the link, but otherwise all they're really relying on is just the title. So the title is important. Make an effort to make this title as broadly understandable as you can while still remaining true to the uh, content of the paper. Abstract, similarly, the abstract now has a newer role compared to 10, 15 years ago because uh, of keyword searches. So the abstract often will uh, is almost like a collection of important keywords written in a form that makes a nice coherent one paragraph uh, precy, for example. Introduction of the paper, the figures, the conclusion and the references all are important. I mean, often uh, people will try to get a gist of the paper after what we call a quick read. And a quick read essentially means looking at the introduction and the figures and and then uh, looking at the figure captions, for example, and then the conclusion. First impressions matter. You want people to want to read the rest of your paper. Um, these are some of the things that uh, you can provide to the editors in addition to the paper itself. So again, as I noted before, you're submitting to PRL for a reason. If you think you should help the editor understand that reason in the cover letter, please do so. Uh, if you think that we should or should not consult particular groups of referees, please tell us and so on. Um, and this is of course uh, applies to many other uh, sorts of uh, responses, but uh, when you are responding to referee reports, please, uh, help the referees and editors understand again and uh, why the paper itself is important. So we often have a scenarios where the submission or the resubmission letter is uh, much more helpful and sometimes longer than the paper. And then that is indeed helpful, but the question immediately arises as to, uh, well, the reader is not gonna be able to see that resubmission letter, the paper has to stand on its own and the paper is not making its own case as strongly as the resubmission letter is. So there's, anyway, so that's uh, kind of my presentation. I'm not going to any, I have a list of questions and such, which I shall, uh, for now, I can go into them if people have other questions, but I'm gonna unshare my screen so we can see each other. And if uh, people have uh, other okay. questions, uh, please ask. Are there more questions? I mean, I, I can ask questions if, <laughs> if we need some time for people to write. Um, okay, please. So, what what is the <clears throat> what is the policy? Is there a policy for let's say unreasonable referees? Let's say um, you know you clearly see that. Uh, <laughs> There's there's some some ref, some referees that clearly understood the paper. They made an effort to do a let's say a good re yeah. reply, no matter if it's you know accept or reject. But then there's some like clearly substandard referee report. Is is there how, how does the editor act in that case? Like what what are the steps? Uh, is there a policy? Like I mean this this case I described is pretty clear, but but let's say yeah is there is there, is there any policy? Yeah, I mean, there are, um, the, by policy, um, I think one, I mean, what steps, what corrective steps should we take, right? So exactly, yeah. there are two levels. Like one is what happens with this particular referee for this particular paper. That's the one thing. So there, of course, uh, what we have is uh, we, uh, this is one of the reasons we typically do not go to just one referee. More often than not, we're going to, uh, two or sometimes if it's more than two rounds or more than one round, we're going to three referees. If the report appears to be quite unreasonable, either off the, right off the bat to the referee, I mean, to the editor, that's clear, but sometimes the authors will uh, make a good case as to why that report should be, you know, has problems in addition to being scientifically incorrect or something. So we will often calibrate it by, uh, you know, and we do this more and more, we will go back to the referee and ask them for certain clarifications. Or we will try to, uh, we call, you know, harmonize, if you will, that's a term, <laughs> by uh, asking the other referees to comment on this report. 
Uh, and uh, then, I mean, and then of course there are cases where the reports are really just not good at all, right? And then we will mark it as that. And then over time, of course, that's a separate issue. It doesn't help this particular paper. Uh, we have, uh, for every report, we have fairly detailed uh, kind of assessment ratings that we provide at the database. And then over time, these numbers are collecting for a particular referee. And if, uh, you know, it's like a rating system and anything else. So if a particular referee over time is either uh, takes much too long or the reports are just not good and so on, then these will be, uh, you know, there'll be a metric attached to the referee, which kind of collects over time as the, you know, and so this referee then falls lower on the list of referees that will consult. But for a particular paper, so let's say you're an author and you've received a couple of reports and you find that one of the reports, I mean, certainly some reports will advise rejection, which you as an author will not like. That's a different issue. But there's a question of they've advised rejection, but in a manner or with particulars that you think clearly any reasonable expert in the field would find objectionable. And then you should point it out as a like a, even a point by point rebuttal, but certainly as a general matter to the editors. If only to tell the editors, hey, look here again, this referee report is just no good for this, this reason. And then we will, uh, you know, there's a PRL, I think, uh, does have a process. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, what, as I noted before, the, there's an element of subjectivity necessarily in that we are often making decisions to not publish papers which are perfectly correct and perhaps even fairly significant. Um, and that's a different issue. I mean, that I think uh, it's not whether a report is good or bad, but a decision may appear to be illogical to the author. But you have to have a global sense of it. So I'll give you an example. I mean, this whole thing about non-hermitian physics I just mentioned, right? I mean, we are receiving so many good papers, if you will, on that topic, that, but we will publish you know, a certain fraction of them, it'll acceptance rate for this year for such papers will probably be higher than the journal's average, quite a bit higher. But still for many of those papers, uh, you know, it just won't be, um, so mm -hmm. they won't appear in the journal. So. Yeah, thanks. Uh, maybe I can read a question here now that I'm here. Uh, uh -huh. So M Mikhail Garcia uh, asks, um, how are authors that go into other fields maybe temporarily considered? Is there known expertise in their original field taken into account? So it's unclear to me if they're asking whether the known expertise is... Um, yeah, I guess if you have a... Taken into account when they're consulted as referees or in looking at their paper when it comes in. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, they're looking... Because authors... So perhaps he means- right. So uh, let's assume, so is there no expertise in the original field taken into account when the paper comes in, but the paper is treated at face value. Sure, we are aware who the author is and we have uh, usually some sense of their track record in a particular field, but we routinely have authors who move from a field to another field and submit papers and so on. Uh, so in that sense, it's not taken into account in the sense that, oh no, this person has only published in quantum Hall effect and now this new material called graphene has arrived. What do they know about this? No, I mean, they know gallium arsenide, but they didn't know graphene. I don't know. Uh, but no, I think that taken into account in that sense, it's just that, uh, yeah, we, uh, um, paper has arrived, we treat the paper at face value. Uh, on the other hand, it's uh, not double mass review. We know the identity of the authors and so on. Now, consulting them as a referee, we will uh, typically, in our own database, we have information as to what they have refereed before, right? So they may have refereed a bunch of papers in a particular field, and now there's a paper in a uh, particular field, but they have just recently moved into that field. There, our database, there's a lag. Our database is not gonna reflect that, their new interest. However, we often will look at Google Scholar or something like that. And so in those instances, our knowledge of this individual's expertise is gonna rely on either something which is organically growing quickly over time, like Google Scholar or uh, the archive, where we have information of what they're just doing now, 
or uh, you know, we may have just been to a conference or something, and this person gave an invited talk, and then we're aware, oh, this is what they're moving into. But they have done good work in some other field. So yes, so the answer is yes. <clears throat> okay. Um, there was a short question on whether it will yeah, be I'm possible looking at to it have also. the slides. Um, yeah, if you feel if you feel you prefer to read it. Uh, it seems as if there is an incentive if you are rejecting a paper to offer a very sparse report. That is, this paper is scientifically correct, but I do not feel that it rises to the level of impact necessary. Uh, ever ask or ask the auditors and courage to ask referees more detail than we specifically about it. Um, so the, ex the example here as like a one-liner, no good, uh, that is not helpful to the authors for sure, but it's not particularly helpful to the to the um, editors. Now, on the other hand, I think the reality is, as I noted before, that our primary aim in PRL through the review process is, the, okay, the primary aim is always to get the referees to tell us if there's something wrong with it, scientifically incorrect, as far as they can tell. But as I noted before, more often than not, that's not the case. It's not that they're scientifically wrong with the paper. Then we are asked, hoping the referees will tell us something about the pros and cons as to whether we should publish it or not, plus suggestions for the authors. And we are really looking for a reason to publish the paper. So if the reverse were the case, which is that the, author, the referee says, this paper is wonderful and you should certainly publish it. That to us is a bigger problem because we will be very reluctant to publish a paper based on extremely, uh, unhelpful short piece of advice. If it's negative, then we will try to get more and we'll try to calibrate what, what the other referees are saying and we will recognize that this is unhelpful and we might go back to the referee and all, but the, unfortunately from the author's perspective, the ground state, which was not yet a PRL remains, right? I mean, this paper is not being shifted above the ground state with any report, so there's that. So it's unfortunate uh, these reports do come in on occasion. We um, we don't, I mean, as, as far as the question also says, if there's an incentive to reject a paper, I mean, there is an in, there's not an incentive, incentive per se because PRL, the, as you know, the review process is, I mean, we have one or two rounds of review. And after that, we, being a society journal, you may appeal a negative decision. They appeal then uh, in, some cases will go to the divisional associate editor, then we have a whole process. And so at some level, it is not in the interest of the journal editor to make arbitrary negative decisions, which to reasonable people will seem illogical because you know, then we are just making life complicated for later on. So we'll try to, I don't know if that answers the question, but uh, so. Um, Yes, I can provide the slide of this later to uh, to Adolfo and he can send it over. Yeah. Okay, there was a question, some other question. Do you think it's possible that some metrics as clicks on Google Scholar mentions in social networks will play a role when determining whether journals should push to publish in some field, which is on the rise, for example? Uh, I don't. I not only think that it's possible, I would not be surprised if this is already happening. Of course, there are some fields. Uh, Google Scholar is, uh, in terms of metrics, you, if you mean appearance of papers, there's two kinds of metrics, right? The, how many papers are being submitted on a, in a given field, and then there's the citation metrics. Citation metrics now, of course, with something like Google Scholar or NASA ADS uh, exists even before a paper is published, which uh, is tempting, I'm sure, for to, I mean, journals and not just journals. I mean, I would say journals or department chairs or funding agencies <clears throat> are often making decisions as to whether a particular field is more topical than some other fields. I mean, I'm sure if you, if you ask for funding from the, you know, uh, from uh, NSF or something, then they will pick and choose fields, right? I mean, they will say that this field is more topical than this other field and so on. So, I, and I don't think those decisions are based 
just on metrics on some entity like Google Scholar. Uh, but on the other hand, they could be based on uh, factors that are not you know, objectively scientific, so to speak. And that's reality. I don't think that's any, any different from what the case was 50 years ago, except you know, we have social media now and we had word of mouth then or something. And one could argue that uh, at least with Google Scholar and even social networks, it's more transparent. People see what's on Google Scholar, people can see what's on social network. If it was just word of mouth, a bunch of people sitting in a room and uh, you know, some you know, Bell Labs or something, you didn't know what was happening. So. I don't know if Anton has a question. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Just uh, raised <laughs> his hands. Yep. Like um, so um, some time ago, and my my numbers are uh, are also a little bit out of date. I tried this uh, a, a couple of years back. I checked uh, how many papers on archive content uh, have an APSDI, and I found uh, that it's like. 70%, which largely makes APS uh, a monopoly on, or the biggest player in condensed matter publishing. Yeah. Um, what, what do you think follows? So, so first of all, is it an impressive result, but also what do you think follows out of this? Uh, I don't, I think, uh, so when you said you checked, now did you check mostly theory papers or all papers? Uh, just all the archive preprints, which so do have I don't a have any uh, special insight, but off the top of my head, I can think of a few reasons, right? So one is, of course, the archive, even after all this time, and when we are thinking of CONMAT or uh, even H, you know, HEPTH or something, um, is largely uh, the world of physics. I mean, so if you have somebody in a chemistry department working on TM, you know, uh, the TMDs, for example, and they are just as likely to submit to ACS Nano. I'm not sure if the archive, you know, through their productive uh, PhD postdoc years has been an entity where they have posted routinely. So I think it's possible that when you are looking at the archive as a marker, uh, then you are uh, by preconditioning yourself to move around in the world of people who come from a physics background. There's that. There's the other thing which also could be true that physics, because of its uh, perhaps perceived, perhaps real focus on uh, what one would term basic science, is, uh, is there's much more theory in PRL in certain fields than others. So if you take a field like topological insulators, for example, or uh, quantum spin hall effect, all these kind of you know, topical subfields. If you look at the, the, the very substantial theoretical advances were published in PRL, but sometimes experimental papers, not so clear. And of course, then you, the corollary of that is that theorists are much more likely, especially in condensed matter, you can check for yourself, <clears throat> much more likely to, sorry, <clears throat> to post on the archive than experimentalists sometimes. And so that, that's another bias that plays into it. And then of course, uh, if you move into the kind of physics that you know, veers towards quantum field theory, ADS-CFT, or even, uh, you know, the topological uh, phases of matter that the people here, or you guys are uh, talking about. I think you, you're kind of working, kind of moving into the world of particle physics and all a little bit. And so there's that also. So I think all these reasons play a role. Uh, a, a test of this, a reverse test of this would be if you went to some big conference in, I don't know, uh, again, uh, 2D materials, let's say where uh, large experimentalist groups and all are, as I said, many of them don't come from the world of physics. And I would not be surprised if many of those papers are not at the archive. Okay. Um, any Maybe other we're all questioned out here. <laughs> Your our, uh, I, 42, uh, 33 panelists are, uh, yeah, still there, but I don't see anything. So I can. I'm not uh, 
participants. I can ask a question uh, on referees. Uh, oh, maybe Reyes wants to ask a question. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> maybe not. Well, I'm, I'm, I was just testing my camera. Okay. 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 Um, so when choosing referees, uh, there's you know, an issue of, um, uh, well, how, you know, career stage. And, uh, you know, you, you can choose uh, postdocs uh, or very well-established uh, scientists mm -hmm. um, or even like, uh, you know, experienced PhDs, let's say. Um, yeah. And so my question is whether that factors in in the way you give to each referee report and also considering the amount of time that, uh, you know, different in, at different stages of the career, one might... Uh, devote to to actually uh, referring a paper basically yeah i think uh, clearly uh, I, I i don't think i mean you know there are people who actually do this kind of research i i <laughs> i haven't but you know so it'd be good to see if there's a correlation between is there a sweet spot in the career path right so you're obviously when you're a grad student you're not doing any referrals so and you're starting presumably in the later grad student or early postdoc years, you become a referee and so on. Mm. And at some point in your career, you probably hit a peak of how much you're engaging as a referee. And then once right. you reach a certain stage, many people will drop off, not everybody. I mean, there are mm. some people very uh, established for many, many years who are very active referees. Mm. Uh, it's difficult to say the correlation, of course, in our case in PRL is we typically add referees to our database who have either been refereed for some other journals in the in APS journals and they have a good track record, or sometimes we'll search for them, uh, you know, and do a Google Scholar search and we'll see that a particular individual has been very active in the recent past, you know, so last three years they've been very active and getting papers published and so on so we'll consult them as a referee and sometimes we'll find that this person happens to be a second year you know first year postdoc and that's okay uh, and of course as we all know that there are uh, some uh, senior graduate students who may be much more productive and connected to any particular community than somebody who's you know been in the field for seven years so there's that but uh, we so un unless we happen to know the person, because uh, sometimes what we'll have is, uh, and we encourage that, uh, we send a referral to a professor and they will say that uh, I don't think I can do it, but uh, my postdoc uh, will be, you know, is eager to help. And then uh, if we see that the postdoc, oh, is somebody who should have been in our database, but is not, but is a good track record, then we'll say, okay, great. Or we might say, would you submit a joint report with this person? And then uh, they, the new person then gets in our database and is there from that point on. Yeah, I guess, in terms I guess, of... oh, sorry. Um, no, I guess just, just an interjection on, on this, the question. Like, um, I guess it, it matters also because you're, you're taking into account the, like a subjective uh, matter uh, right. or like, yeah. and then you might not have, you know, a late PhD right. or early first of man, I'd have the that's, same that's true. opinion of what's why, yeah. Right. So the subjective matter, I agree with you that sometimes a different weight should be applied. And I think it's the job of the editor to apply that weight, to weight it differently. In other words, to uh, the assessment. I mean, the way I, I see is that the assessment of the subjective element that I mentioned can be done two ways. One way is for the editor alone to make that choice. Of course, then all kinds of you know, biases, including the editor's own bias, their knowledge or lack of knowledge of the field and how connected or disconnected they are to the community. All of that plays a role just as much, except now it's just one point of, uh, one point of um, comparison. Now, our attitude is that instead of a single point of reference, we kind of try to correlate uh, two or three other people in the mix. And then, of course, we should uh, be aware that, uh, oh, yeah, this referee provided a great technical report, but their assessment of developments in the field compared to other fields may not be as. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. But that this is also not necessarily tied to seniority. Uh, there are people who have been working in the field for 10, 15 years who may have a fairly narrow view 
compared to somebody who's kind of moved into yeah. the field but is more willing to educate themselves on. <clears throat> I don't know if there are any more questions. It's already uh, quite uh, after time. Um, yeah, I think we are. Anton, uh... <laughs> you're smiling. I don't know if you have a question. <laughs> we can give you a last question <laughs> if you want. Yeah, right. I, I, so, so um, first of all, I would like to I would like to return to our uh, discussion uh, in uh, chat about uh, the yeah. publishing of code and yeah. data. Yeah. And um, so, so I, I understand uh, your statement that different questions have different or different communities have different yeah. standards. That's yeah. uh, that's perfectly fine. Um, but at the same time, um, on the one hand. Uh, uh, and in some cases, there are really good arguments uh, for not imposing a central policy. I, I also take that. But uh, at the same time, on the one hand, um, problems of reproducibility are as valid in physics as in any other uh, field and uh, field of science. And you mentioned the engagement with the broader public. So for that, uh, certainly re reliability of the published results seems important. Um, yeah. Also, uh, so, so overall, I, I, I also didn't encounter strong arguments against requiring uh, code or data. So, so I'm, I'm a little bit uh, 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 surprised to, to encounter the hesitancy to, to impose a policy there. Well, I think, um, um, I mean, again, I, I think that the distinction uh, is the difference is here between requiring something and then having to police it and then having to deal with communities who are resistant versus encouraging it. I mean, there are three levels, right? Allowing, we're clearly there, encouraging, we are there, we encourage, but we don't proactively encourage in the sense that editors aren't going out and saying, you need to do it. But if, if it turns out that it's there or if referees tell us that it should be there, then we'll push the authors to provide that information. And the next level is requiring. Actually, I have uh, just learned that requiring is a very high bar. You, most journals do not actually require in the sense that it is not as if they will refuse to publish a paper if that information is not provided. They will have a statement, they'll have, they'll have a uh, declaration statement of some sort. So we don't actually require the declaration statement, but I think, uh, you know, and this is, it's similar as I noted earlier to contribution statements. I think there are journals that require contribution statements or strongly encourage that this person did this and this person did the simulations, this person, uh, uh, you know, ran the code and so on. Uh, we don't, and partly it's because uh, we haven't, and maybe it's historical inertia, but partly it's because in some fields, it would be certainly extremely unpopular and therefore essentially unenforceable. I mean, we could change it. We could take a position that says we will not publish a paper unless you do this, but I think that's not a position we're willing to take now because, you know, I mean, it's, this is, of course, true in all kinds of areas. And as I said, uh, the author, there's a page, there's a length requirement. I mean, all, there are many instances, not just with journals, where there's a reluctance to require something because as soon as you say required, then the next question will be, what are you going to do with people who don't uh, follow? Are you going to not publish their papers? And our answer is we don't know. Uh, I think uh, on the other hand, if a community overall started pushing for it big time, and there are areas such as the field of uh, artificial neural networks, machine learning, and so on, there is a sense that this data should be available. And then, uh, you know, every if, if there's a general sense that every paper that comes in that we are reviewing, we're sending it to referees, we're getting to publish, referees are routinely asking this kind, then it becomes a community thing where everybody is. But at the same time, if there's some other community, it's not like, so then, yeah. So then it's not required because in a journal, you can't say if it happens to be in this field. I mean, you know, there are others. Um, so yeah, so anyway, that's where we are at. 
Okay, very good. Um, I think we should start closing because if not, we'll do a closing statement without right. anyone to close. <laughs> That's order. right. Please. Uh, yeah. So I yeah. I will uh, turn off my camera and I I am not sharing my screen. So very nice to. Yeah. Thank you. Part. Thank you for your Wonderful. very nice talk. Great. Uh, yeah. Thank you for guys. being here. And please, Thanks. yeah, please do send me um, your slides or or put. I will send you my slides, and if anyone has any follow up questions, please send them to Adolfo, who will forward them to me. Absolutely, yeah, uh, and yeah, th I'm I'm gonna thank um, yeah, thank Jeremy for um, for uh, for the nice talk and every, all the rest of the speakers. And I think on behalf of all the organizers, I'm uh, gonna close this last session and last day of the Topological Matter School. I hope you uh, uh, well register for the next one next year, which we hope uh, we will be able to host you here in San Sebastian. If not, <laughs> uh, we'll be online, but uh, but still nonetheless um, something topological and and something uh, interesting. So thank you for attending and and. Uh, I hope you uh, got something out of it. Please follow us on Twitter and YouTube and so on, which uh, um, help, you know those kind of things help us uh, go on and justify this the existence of the school. And uh, yeah, uh, thanks uh, to all the speakers and and see you see you next next year. Goodbye.